Most universities are both teaching and research institutions, and those two aspects inform one another. Universities also act as hubs that draw in other organisations that have something to gain from their research. This might be the creation of a science park, where technical companies make commercial applications from their research, or other groupings. Here in Cambridge we have a rapidly developing biomedical area where biomedical research institutes and companies work in association with hospitals. Or there's the Attenborough building, where several conservation organisations are gathered, close to the zoology and plant sciences departments. These groupings of organisations are also benefiting from the more fundamental aspect, that universities bring together different disciplines. The close proximity of departments within the city or campus make this easy, and that's particularly true in a collegiate university like Cambridge, where everyone interacts with people from other disciplines every day. Everyone benefits from coming across widely differing disciplines, and that's particularly important in the sciences. Most science is interdisciplinary these days. You'd have to go into a new and extremely specialised field, or alternatively be dealing with really fundamental aspects, to be working purely on biology, chemistry or physics. The interdisciplinary connections are what makes universities particularly important in dealing with the pressing issues of our time, most obviously pandemics and climate change. The role of universities in pandemics is immediately obvious with vaccine development, where those biomedical associations have contributed enormously to the speed of vaccine development and of testing. Many of the COVID treatments also came from university biomedical collaborations. But more widely than that, University researchers have been investigating the biology of the disease agents, using cellular biological techniques in collaboration with some of the microscopy and imaging developed in physical laboratories. Prior to the COVID pandemic, research into human disease origins had identified a number of likely spillover locations, probably involving bats and wildlife trade. These were based on collaborations between virologists, wildlife biologists, epidemiologists, sociologists and economists. This is a particularly good example of the interdisciplinary nature of science today. In order to understand the risks and what we may be able to do about them, firstly we need to know what the reservoirs of potentially risky viruses are. Several diseases have crossed from bats to humans in the past and they seem to be a particularly big reservoir of viruses. So the virology of bats and their viruses is particularly important. They may come into contact with humans through roosting in houses, through our encroaching on forest habitats, or through a third species, which is the likely connection to food markets. For this part, we need an understanding both of bat biology and human activity through forest clearance and market trading. Epidemiology, based upon the virology, the bat biology and the human behaviour, may give us an indication of how serious the spillover event might be. All of this ought to allow us to prioritise actions that could enable us to re reduce the risk of disease spillover. So whilst science gets ever more specialist, the big problems require broad teams. With climate change, the issues are even bigger. Again, it's the specialist institutes and the multidisciplinary teams that play the biggest roles in the research. Here at Cambridge we have the Scott Polar Research Institute and the British Antarctic Survey, so there's an obvious local interest in climate aspects. The Cambridge Centre for Climate Science combines the research from several departments, applied maths, theoretical physics, archaeology, chemistry, earth sciences, geography, plant sciences, and the Scott Polar Institute. Their research covers modelling of carbon cycles and ocean circulation, modelling and monitoring of ice sheets and sea level, and reconstruction of past changes. There's also more specific research looking at many of the complex interactions affected by climate change. For example, a colleague here at Peterhouse looks at the flow of nutrients between the land and lakes and how that is changing. Those are changes that result from things like temperature-driven population fluctuations, 
in the insects that feed on forest trees or changes caused by the melting of permafrost. Even with this specific example, you can see that the university brings together the fields needed for this – biochemistry, genetics, remote sensing, climatology and broader scale ecology – plus the taxonomy needed to be sure of the species being studied. The other side of this is that this research creates fantastic opportunities for students. What I've just been describing is research that's carried out by our PhD students. But university gives you the opportunity to take part in these sorts of research projects as parts of undergraduate projects or of vacation internships. Of course, it's a two-way opportunity. We also depend on highly motivated students to take this research forward and to bring new thinking into the universities.